Welcome, everyone. I'm Connie Borden, president of Shintaido of America, and I'm excited to share with you the following panel discussion about our newest Shintaido book, Shakunetsu, Chronicles of the Creation of Shintaido, a Japanese martial art. This book by Pierre Kite contains interviews with 19 people who studied in the 1960s and 1970s with Aoki Sensei, before Shintaido was called Shintaido. In the opening of the book, Peter Furtado writes, Shakunetsu literally means scorching heat, the heat of the furnace that turns steel white hot before it is beaten and folded to create a precious, potent, beautiful katana. The heat that Aoki Sensei alluded to in his visionary manifesto for a new martial art beyond karate a manifesto he titled Life Burn. Four Shintaido instructors who have professional backgrounds in writing and editing, as well as teaching history and philosophy, make up our panel for these discussions. These four are Peter Furtado, Lee Seaman, Lee Ordman, and Nancy Billius. We are here to hear their impressions of the process of editing and proofing so join me now as I join the panel and we discuss these topics. What drew this editing group to this enormous undertaking of releasing Shakunetsu in English? Why were they interested in this effort? And what did they learn from surprising moments in this editing process? If you are really interested in Shintaido, you really need to read the book. And that's not a that's nobody's paying me to say that. It's just that it gives you such a different perspective and such a different, oh, that's why they do this. And this is where that came from. It just explains so much that we take for granted because we do it, mm -hmm. but then we don't really know why we do it or how it came about that it's done that way. And and really the book sheds so much light on on so many mm -hmm. aspects of it, for me anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Lee, what would you like to say about the value of reading this book, both within the community of Shintaido and to the larger community? I think the most interesting part of the book is that it has impacted, it makes it really clear how people's lives were impacted by Shintaido. And uh, that is something that we all need. Um, and any additional tool in our toolbox that allows us to realize our impact on other people mm -hmm. and to um, the people I met in Shintaido were not um, changed to be different. They were changed to be more themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can do that our own selves, uh, the more hope we have for the future mm -hmm. and the world and um, everyone who comes after us. So uh, that was that would be what I would like to to share with people through this book and um, through the practice and through my own teaching. Is, you know, um, the more we are who we are, mm -hmm. uh, the bigger we are and the brighter we are and the uh, more multifaceted we are. And that is a benefit to all of us. Did, did you have something that came from reading? Because you're reading the biographies pretty intently. Yeah. Well, I started on the project because Ito Sensei asked me to help with the um, glossary. Um, I was working on the uh, um, glossary and it was really interesting. And it kept mentioning all these things that I hadn't really thought about for a while. The early Dakotenkai and reminded me of how I felt being part of that group and um, how some of the good things and the bad things and the um, complicated things. Um, mm -hmm. And it really made me want to read the biographies because in the process, he mentioned that there were biographies. So I volunteered to do a, a final uh, read through on uh, several of the biographies. And I was just struck by how applicable 
this art form that started in the 1960s and was so vibrant in the 1960s and early 70s um, and then kind of grew up and and had to go to work and all that stuff and we kind of muddled on for a while and it seems to me that we're getting to a point now where we are coming into ourselves as a international movement as a that's the wrong word um an international agent for change ah um and it, it it's it was in the 60s and it seems to me that we are there again now and just reading all the biographies reminded remind confirmed me in that uh uh, feeling mm -hmm. this is a really interesting time right now mm -hmm. to be a part of Shintaito mm -hmm. and it was then too it was it was amazing mm -hmm. just just like worlds were opening for me and for um, the Japanese people who were, we were practicing with them it was just a, a world opening time mm -hmm. and um, uh, now we're two yeah huh I too was enthralled reading the biographies and learning about people hearing their actual voices mm -hmm. uh, greatly impacted me. One of the things that impressed me so much about the book, I knew of maybe not quite 30, have a third of the people that were in the book. And um, the, those interviews are amazing. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, ring true. They're genuine. They're sincere. Uh, they manifest the, um, core of the people that uh, from the group that I knew as 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 they presented to me so they're consistent uh it, it's a phenomenal uh work it, it sounds it's so good that it sounds like it just fell onto the page accidentally you know but mm -hmm. somebody just happened to, happened to be writing a few things down when they were talking and and it, it, it's harder than that <laughs> You had a couple different tasks, um, but one of them was to reorder a part of the book. Tell us about that experience of taking uh, something that uh, Pierre had put and reordering it to the more the beginning of the book and some of the content. What was that like? Well, yes. My role in this book, I think, was to work with Pierre on the academic aspects of, um, of the book. So... The structure of the book is that there is a, a, a academic support um, for the central set of interviews which he created. Um, and he had produced the book in French, obviously, primarily for an academic so, um, uh, an ac academic audience uh, of sociologists and anthropologists. Um, and it was structured in the way that was suitable for that particular market. Um, my background as a as an editor that I was mentioning earlier, I always saw as a question of making it possible for an author's voice and intention to come over as clearly as possible to whatever the audience was that we were aiming at with the particular publication. So Pierre had structured his book for his original French academic audience. And as uh, many of us know, a lot of uh, French people love their philosophy, their abstractions, sometimes their, their verbiage in that sort of area, which is quite difficult, I think, for many Anglo-Saxons to deal with a lot of that material. Um, and particularly uh, for the for a publication by Shintaido America, which is primarily aimed not at academics, uh, but at a general audience. So Pierre had produced his book very interestingly. Now, um, he had introduced it. He had written a chapter basically about the history of uh, karate shintaido practice in Japan. Then he then the main body of the book, which was the, the 19 or so interviews. And then finally, a chapter um, of co um, contextualizing all of this material within the context of 1960s Japan. Behind that, there were some uh, appendices. Um, one of the appendices, appendix, appendices, yes, um, was his research method. Mm -hmm. um, and his research method was extremely interesting. It was about how he had gone about 
locating the various people who we're going to interview, how he had gone about approaching those interviews, given the fact that he himself is, uh, his Japanese was not adequate. He was presumably supported by Ito Sensei. Uh, how those interviews went, he then stopped for a while, for many years, and then returned to it, and then had to return to the interviews and going through this whole process. How um, his, his relationship with Ap Sensei in the course of uh, constructing the, the book and so on. This was appendix material from the point of view of the French academic audience. Mm-hmm. But from the point of view of Shintaido audience, this is absolutely central and makes it clear what the rest of the book was going to be. Mm-hmm. So we took this appendix, we we put it in the introduction, and I think it works much, much better. And uh, and the voice, the intention of the book becomes much clearer, I think, to everybody. Mm. That's, that's really wonderful work, Peter. All right, Lee. So tell me some of your impressions of the process of editing and proofreading, and you work particularly in some of the biographies. So tell me about your thoughts of the of that process of editing and proofreading. You know, I think one of the things that amazed me was also the context, the cultural context of the times. And I think mm. the book, the book, um, the first part of the book is a cultural history. I think is a is a is a is somewhat academic. It's a sociology, uh, in a kind of sociology which is about sort of you know, the unadulterated word of the people who are there. And then you just take that on as like evidence and not w- without overly an over interpretation. But the, then there's the biography, which is, supports the, in the, the academic part uh, as sort of like the evidence that they're all talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, Shintaido as uh was more a part of the the avant-garde of post-war Japan. I always knew it was. Uh, and I, I'd done some studying about that period. I've, you know, I've written about, I was a, a, a dance critic for a while in Tokyo and I wrote about Buto. And some of the Buto dancers and the artists that I knew knew Aoki Sensei. They knew Aoki Sensei. Mm-hmm. They knew of Shintaido, you know. And reading the biographies, I see. There was actually a, a, a fair amount of cross simpatico between those groups. They they knew each other. They related to each other. They participated in events with each other. I didn't realize that. I can't remember her name, but one of the Rakutenkai members, a woman, um, you know, was actually produced a famous uh, avant-garde dance festival, body body movement festival on uh, on the ocean side at Kujukuri in Chiba huh. Prefecture. That was sort of like a you know a cultural touchstone of the day, and it was you know Rakutenkai was in in it essentially uh, you know part of that, mm-hmm. um, and also like the history of these people who came out of you know, such a dark time, World War II, um, mm-hmm. who experienced all that, each of them, uh, many of them have very evocative and uh, heart-wrenching stories of being children during mm-hmm. that time and emerging from in the poverty uh, of a country just taken to its knees by the war. And um, uh, just very heart-wrenching stories of you know the, the the people's efforts to overcome poverty and to achieve education and and aspire to something new out of the ashes of the war and 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 the hard times they had as children and uh the hope that you that you feel in in their efforts and their faith you know in their work is is really inspiring and uh humbling so I think I think people should read it for that reason as well. Yeah, I, and I forget, you know, that that the you know, I was thinking about the cultural history and la la la, and you know, avant garde. It was a, it's a story of of really young people, yes. you know, youth culture. The Japan Japanese youth culture was phenomenally powerful, and this was uh, like one sort of thread of that mm. in a really 
remarkable one. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a remarkable time, and I think uh, mm -hmm. historically very interesting. I think Pierre is offering it up to the to scholars in the future. Yeah. Do you want to say some more on this subject of Rakutenkai, what that word means, what you thought that understood this group of people trying to achieve? Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, these historical survey, which uh, certainly uh, accords with what, what I've come across. And it's always fascinated me, I think, that um, Aksensei um, in particular was working with Western literature, Western art, Western, Western culture, and bringing this to, uh, to, to the, the students, to the, to the members of the Rakhinkai. And I think we learned that from, from the interviews, how, uh, how excited they were um, in encountering so much of this material. Um, that it was available clearly in Japan, but not available to all to all the young people until they were until they were shown it and bringing it into this group, um, Rakutenkai, as we know, means uh, the band band of optimists, uh, people looking for something better, and they needed something better in that world, um, the post-war world. They didn't want to be caught up in the, the militarism in the conservatism that was implied in the in much of the uh, traditional martial arts clubs at, at, at that time um, and uh, the other aspect is the is the introduction of christianity and there's a whole history of christianity within japan um and that um for many years it was a uh, it was Persecuted back in the back in the seventeenth century, many thousands of, of, of Christians were killed, and uh, and yet in the twentieth century it returned in this in uh, after the opening um, that Lee was speaking about. Part of what is fascinating for me and what I've been learning about about the Rakutenkai was the way that they were introducing Christianity. Many of them converting to Christianity, some of them staying with it for, the, for their lives. Um, as well as the uh, traditional Japanese religions, um, Shinto and, uh, and, and, and Buddhism and so on. Um, and somebody interested in, in many religions, uh, this is clearly another very exciting aspect, I think, of what we have in Shintaido and need, need, to, need to understand and need to preserve. Mm. Well, let's let's keep moving on then with this process of editing and proofreading. So, Nancy, what were some of your impressions as you, you know, looked at the sections you were working with? Um, what what thoughts have come up for you? It was so amazing to read about the early days. Wow! I mean, I've been doing Chintado all this time, and I had no idea. I've read a lot of little bits and pieces, but I and I've read a lot of body dialogue articles, but I've never I never read about the origins in the depth that this book provides. It was eye opening. It was revelatory. It was um, it was delightful. Mm -hmm. I am jealous that that we don't have the Rakutenkai now, but or that same kind of dedication or that same kind of uh, tribal feeling, but. But it was lovely to know that that's how it started. And so that's, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more thing. One more thing. That chapter on counterculture really was enlightening to me in terms of contextualizing the origins of Shintaido. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome. I should also say that uh, this became important uh, because um, a number of people were asked to take part in this project and not everybody was eager to do so. And that's because uh, our our sense of Shintaido history is largely codified in the, what we call the Shintaido book. Um, and uh, that's our version of it. And it's one version. It's pretty much Aoki Sensei's version of it. And in this book, um, besides the 
the, the, the biographies, which I think are the part of the book, which are of main interest to Shintaito people, uh, provide an aggregate, a kind of raw uh, and diverse historical contribution to Aoki Sensei's version. Uh, and the book might be criticized that it that Aoki Sensei uh, doesn't participate. He doesn't have a biographical, autobiographical sketch in it. Um, he's not directly interviewed at length. Uh, but we have that in the Shintaido book. And so uh, I think in balance, they can work together. But the it, reason it was difficult for some people to participate was that they were afraid to offend Aoki Sensei because here was a different mm -hmm. version of history. You know, nobody is perfect, but is seen by intimates uh, in their at their best. And I think a number of participants were brave enough, the autobiographical uh, writers were brave enough to talk about uh, difficult feelings they had about their experience. And, um, and, and when those difficult feelings involved Alki Sensei, that made it, uh, uh, some people were wary of, of, of participating in, in perhaps causing some confusion or disruption in, in, in perhaps uh, their relationship with Alki Sensei. And I think uh, the people who were the editors who chose to edit were a, a group who felt that, you know, in, uh, light is important. And sometimes it's not the light you expect coming from the direction you expect it. Yeah. Uh, it all is a, uh, it all contributes to our understanding of our history and it's our history. It's not just Aoki Sensei's history because we, um, you know, uh, to a greater degree, such as the, those who were Aku Tenkai members who were creators of Shintaido uh, and each of us who as Go Reisha, uh, are in small ways, are creators of Shintaido. I think mm -hmm. it is our history. So uh, it's like the DNA of Shintaido. And when you do your DNA test, suddenly you discover you had ancestry you didn't you didn't realize. <laughs> Both disturbing of your worldview, but it's also kind of exciting. So, uh, well, expressly, what essential pieces now the Shintaido audience and other interested people could learn about how Pierre put this work together? What were the essentials you sort of learned from that study and that rewrite? One of the reasons that I found this project really attractive and one of the reasons I've always found Shintaido really attractive is the way in which Shintaido is based in the culture of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always seen it as being part of the counterculture of the 1960s um, and clearly Aksensei's interest in avant-garde art and, and so on made it clear that that was the case. This book makes the case for that very, very clearly and very interestingly in a very rich manner. Uh, Pierre has uh, worked with a French uh, academic, uh, Edgar Mora, who wrote an extraordinary, actually, diary called a California Diary about being in the counterculture in San Francisco and Los Angeles in 1969. Um, much of it very funny, much of it very anecdotal, but also very, very insightful about what the counterculture really was. And he provided a, a set of, I think, six or seven different themes that Pierre has then teased out of the Rakutenkai um, practice uh, and, uh, and ideology. That was fascinating for me. And beyond that, he placed it in the context, the political context of what was going on in the student movement in Japan, which, um, and also the avant-garde culture that was going on in Japan at that point, and really, really enriched my understanding of the world in which the Rakutenkai and Akutensei were working. Um, and for me, that has really deepened and strengthened and brought to light my understanding of the roots of, of the Keiko that we, that we do today. Thank you, Peter. So, Lee, do say more about, since you were in Japan in, the, in that 1975 time, um, what was the culture and the training happening uh, in Japan, that avant-garde and that that piece, what, what was it you experienced and you're aware of? 
Japan is such an interesting society. The um, uh, Meiji Restoration in 1860-ish, uh, I don't have the exact dates on the tip of my tongue, but the um, a little bit after the middle of the 19th century, uh, Japan had been extremely closed, mm -hmm. a very hierarchical society, a very uh, traditional society with some um, not unrest, but some gradual change coming through the merchant class, as I understand it. But suddenly, uh, the gunboats came in, and uh, the country was opened forcibly by uh, Admiral Perry. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not colonized like uh, most of the rest of Asia. Um, and the Japanese uh, looked around, they looked at the guns, and they looked at a few other things, but particularly the guns, and uh, they um, had a little chat amongst themselves in the form of a civil war and uh, restored, it, they restored the emperor, which meant that actually the emperor's new uh, guiding people uh, were Western oriented. So they did a massive switch from uh, about the 1860s to the 1890s to um, uh, completely change their culture, the, the top part of the culture. And Japan has always been a top-down uh, society. And uh, they did the same thing again in the 1920s in a very unfortunate turn to um, uh, militarism and totalitarianism, but it, it wasn't, the totalitarianism wasn't a big stretch because they had not actually been untotalitarian. Um, and then in the with the American occupation after the Japanese defeat, they did a complete change again. Um, it's, uh, it's the uh, Some of the films right after World War II, right after the surrender are just poignant because the people were, they didn't know what had happened. They didn't know what was up. They were like somebody in a... Um, wave in the surf who isn't sure which way is up and which way is down and all they can know is that they're being scraped along the sand mm -hmm. you know it, it was they were desolated and uh -huh. as we know japan then changed and became a western superpower and then has changed again to be a western aging power it's such a amazing amount of change that has happened in that society <laughs> to me shintaido is representation of the 60s but to me it's also a representation of this long and tumultuous change in mm. japan mm. Um, the people were so amazing and so revolutionary and so connected to their japanese roots at the same time as you know doing their best to be free of japanese constraints so uh I, that was part of why I was so interested. And it's also part of why I've stayed with, uh, continued to do for Shintaido for, it'll be 50 years pretty soon. Uh, yeah, it's like, boy, how did that happen? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an amazing expression of an amazing country uh, in a way that the country doesn't usually see itself. And so I think Shintaido is quite fascinating mm. and besides that I've had a really good time myself and it's changed me as a person completely so awesome. I used to be shy mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Peter did something leap out or gradually change for you as you looked at this book and in terms of some of your thoughts or impressions I think uh, one of the things that really struck me was how young everybody was at that point. You know, we're all in, in the early 20s, I can say maybe in his later 20s. Uh, mm. And uh, like a group of university students, you know, some, for some people, it was effectively their university because the university were closed for it. And, and then seeing the interviews later on, how Shintaido or how rather the Rakutenka experience had impacted on their lives in different ways. Some obviously staying with the practice 
for many, many decades, others moving away from it, but still the different ways in which it had, it had affected them was, was rich. I sometimes think that those of us who stay, well, we sometimes wonder about why St. Ida stays small and why only some people stay with it for a long time as, mm. as we have. And I sometimes think maybe we're the unusual ones and the other people, they do their section, their, their bit of a bit of Shintaida, they do their jumping, they do whatever. And then they go off and live the rest of their lives as, um, doing something else. And, uh, and it was so interesting to see that many of this group were the same. Uh, uh, they, yes. They, they'd taken it and they'd gone off and they'd, they'd, they'd lived their lives with, with the Shintaida, with the, with the, the, the Keiko. In their hearts, so uh, so that was that was really enriching to see. The other thing I've just been getting into a slight tangle in my language there because I hadn't realised, and I still haven't quite grappled with it, um, that during the Rakutenkai period it wasn't something called Shintaido. It was only when the Rakutenkai were disbanded that it, that the Shintaido curriculum, the Shintaido name, was was. Uh, taken on board and Shintaido was created. So um, that's, uh, it's just a, it's just a language thing, I think, but it's a, it's an important language thing for me to get, get my head around that. Yeah. I'm gonna take you a little bit more on that, Peter, because I think language does shape how we think and what we do. So if something wasn't being called by a name and yet they were doing a practice, what did they consider they were doing as you read it and you heard? What did you believe that they were seeking doing? Well, since they had written his manifesto, which was called Life Burn, and I guess the um, Shakunetsu, the crucible kind of idea of the, the title of the book is, is about the life burning, the intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was saying that it would, be a development of karate, but might not, might not be called karate anymore. I don't know whether they thought they were still doing karate or um, Shin Wataido or Sogobudo or, or, or something. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they what they would have answered at that point. I don't remember whether that came up in any of the interviews uh, that I read. But, um, and there was an there was a very interesting phrase which I would love to there were a lot would love to know more about. There are lots of aspects in the book that I would like to know more about that got hinted and didn't get resolved. And um and actually the end of the Rekuten Kai was part of that. But before it ended, there were clearly hints that Rekuten Kai was moving in the direction of potentially being what we would now call a cult. In that mm -hmm. sense, as a cult, cult leader, and they were trying to organize uh, communal living um, ways of earning their money so that they could remain in support. And they were, they were clearly concerned about it. And, and then uh, Nagawa Sensei, I think, explained the moment that uh, Sensei decided to call a halt to Rakutenkai to stop any, any danger of that sort. Mm -hmm. but he said, from then on, Rakutenkai wasn't a cult. But Shintaido became our cult, was the phrase that, uh, that Nagawa Sensei used. And I would like to know a little bit more. And I'm slightly sorry the book doesn't, doesn't explain mm. a little bit more about what he meant at that point. Lee, um, did something uh, grab you? We spoke a little bit about some of it, but any of this from uh, these conversations uh, bring up something you wanted to say about why this book is special and why people should read it? I think it shows through the book and also from my own personal experience in Japan. I remember, because I am Christian and I had been baptized just two months before I started Shintaido. Oh. So I uh, dropped in as a brand new Christian into a group of other very enthusiastic Christians of about the same age and uh, about the same level of, of weirdness. We were all, 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 even the Japanese were kind of like foreigners in Japan. <laughs> because uh, Shintaida was such an unusual thing. Uh, there were a lot of things that I saw that were cult adjacent, you know, could have been a cult. And my impression was that Aoki Sensei was always uh, tried to be on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
he was such a charismatic person. And Japan is, there's, um, there are fewer boundaries between uh, senior and junior than we have in our culture. And at the time, even more so. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed to me that Aoki Sensei was determined <laughs> to show it, to make his feet of clay very obvious. Oh. And interestingly, uh, a lot of the people around him were as well. It wasn't, uh, nobody gossiped or, or uh, and, and in, in Japan, you don't criticize the uh, leader, you just go away. So uh, there were a lot of people who just went away and uh, I might find out five or 10 years later or when reading this book <laughs> that they'd gone away because they were upset with something. But um, but I, I do remember being very, um, Aksensei was really open, uh, even when he was doing um, uh, things that didn't seem very kind or um, moral. Or uh, that's those words are a little bit strong, but uh, it was really easy if you paid attention at all to see that he was a human being mm. uh, who was a very talented human being, and I, I think that is probably one of the strong factors that kept Shintaido from becoming a, a cult of Aoki uh, is because he was he was so against it and, and the people that he attracted oh my the people around him at the the, the core people were just amazing um keen thinkers and um uh, The, just the opposite of yes, ma'am. Mm. So uh, that, and he kept, they, they, they stayed mm. for a long time. So uh, that was, that was good for mm. the group. Um, before we do a sort of a closing, um, just open it for a moment. If something else has bubbled up that you wanted to talk about in terms of something else learned or something unexpected, an unexpected moment. I could I could say uh, one thing that's come up that I worked on at length uh, was uh, getting the words right, um, huh. and so I much of I, I wish I could have done this for all the biographies, and I could only do it for some because uh, uh, there was just we were on a deadline, and there was only so much uh, time I could squeeze in for it, but uh, was getting the words right. Some of these uh, translations, uh, they came to me as translations, uh, mechanical translations from the original French version of the book. And so I was triangulating some translations when the English, French to English translation of a Japanese, originally Japanese text came to me. Uh, I would triangulate the, the translations using what I could discern from the from the Japanese then the English Japanese to English translation and the French translation of the Japanese to English and using all these to try to come figure out what the original intention might have been knowing mm -hmm. Shintaido as I do because mm -hmm. the translations the machine translations would sometimes muddy muddy the the language and mm -hmm. so that was that was um, a great education to me uh, but, but the Pierre was always careful and reminding me that we're not making in the bios, you know, the smoothest, easiest, most, you know, we want, we don't want necessarily the bios to be uh, the most colloquial of English because uh, sometimes in the, the Japanese to English, you might find an expression that is so, it, that it really um, kind of has a, the conveys the feeling of Japanese uh, language without, um, you know, if you translate in perfect English, you might lose a certain cultural uh, quality. 
and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we had to be very careful that we didn't over translate. And one instance was when Ito Sensei was uh, wrote in, uh, I think he may have been interviewed in English. So I was now at, at, at I was looking at Ito Sensei's uh, English, and he used some very kind of imaginative but non colloquial wor wording to describe the moment that Eiko was invented and or mm. discovered or revealed. And, uh, you know, it's a critical moment in our history. It's like an er moment for us. It's, it's a moment in the history of martial arts. And it's a moment that may was never, nothing like it had happened ever, mm. I think. And so when Ito Sensei to try to Ito Sensei used, uh, I won't I won't say what he said because I want you to read the book. But he used <laughs> words that were non colloquial and had a meaning that was both mysterious and hard to understand. And I I I wanted to understand what he meant. And he and I worked hours, it seems, going back and forth and even talking about what the feeling was that he remembers having felt. And after all that work, we just, for, for in that one critical spot, we used the original language that Ito created because oh. it was, it, it's ineffable what he was trying to say. Yeah. So, so it, we created a, a, a maybe an, an idiom that was, ex, that exists for the first time for, the the moment that echo appeared for the first time wow now we definitely want people to read the book no thank you lee yeah. definitely definitely deepening yeah. deepening one's understanding uh, so there's so much to learn uh i think it, it's it's not going to be easy for people to read a lot of it because it's mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very it's a lot of it's pretty raw mm -hmm. it's also very inspiring you know uh, mm -hmm. Because they 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 didn't stick around, and you just thought, oh, they they you know they left Shintaido, and uh, you wonder why. But some of them actually, their their work in life is con continually inspired by Shintaido, even though they're not regularly doing keiko anymore. And it's inspiring to see how how they how the Shintaido can how Shintaido lives on in them in different and expresses itself in different ways. Mm. Mm. Yeah. very well said yeah. you know the the whole what lee was saying about the the darkness of mm. japanese life right after the war during of course during the war but also after the war and the world is in a really dark place now mm. and we need optimism we need people who can give us something to hold on to. Mm -hmm. And so learning more about the origins of Shintaido can help us maybe bring what we need to, to the world mm -hmm. that Shintaido has to offer. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> that was such a profound, deep statement. I'll spend weeks thinking about that, Nancy. <laughs> Something you'd like to say in closing about uh, encouraging others, both within and the community beyond, to read this book. Uh, I think it's a book that anybody who reads Tanishin needs to needs to read, needs to understand, particularly as uh, that early generation is now moving moving on, and uh, we don't have return um, many hours since but who you knows for how for how long? Um, and we here we have the real voices of the real people who created this mm -hmm. extraordinary art that we've been talking about and that we've all received so much from. And I I do believe that um, the reason for studying Shintaido is because it's going to help change the world. And mm -hmm. it. I've always I thought that ever since that very first Keiko, and I still think it it can. And they absolutely had the vision that it was doing that. That's what they were doing was changing Japan, changing mm. the world. And we need the world. I'm saying the world needs changing now so much. And 
here is here's the toolkit. We just got to get out there, do some jumping. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for your time.